Welcome to Cacao and Jade, the diffusion of the calendars along Maya pre-classic trade routes, with newsletter editor Jim Reed as your host. I honor the ancient sea merchants who travel back and forth from the Ecuadorian Pacific coast of South America following the turtles to the El Salvadorian Guatemalan and Soconusco coasts of Mesoamerica. I honor the ancient land merchants who traded products and shared the new and evolving ideas about their spiritual and ceremonial relationship to the land and all its varied inhabitants, along with interpreting the nighttime skies above them. And I honor the Olmec and Maya royalty who spurred on this whole cultural evolution with their desires to consume the best cacao and wear the most precious jade. Cacao and Jade is dedicated to archaeologists and my good friend, Mary Lou Reidinger, who has lived in Guatemala for more than 40 years. The love for jade and the knowledge of its source was lost to the Americas by the time of the Spanish conquest. But in 1974, after studying the work of Foss Hag and Leslie, Mary Lou and her husband Jay Ridinger discovered a large outcropping of fine jadeite in Guatemala. Scattered on the surface were some of the original jade working tools of the ancient Maya. After assaying the stone and testing some of the museum jades, it was proven that this jade outcropping had been the source of many pre-Columbian jade objects. Hades S.E.A. was formed and began to mine, work, and train native Guatemalans once again in the fine art of jade carving. It took 30 years to convince the Guatemalan government that there was jade out there in them thar hills. At one time, Hades, now called Jade Maya, owned the property around 11 jade sources. Since Jay passed on some years ago, Mary Lou has spearheaded the company into the future, and she has evolved as the leader in reintroducing Maya jade from the Americas to the world through the discovery, mining, working, and teaching about Guatemala's fine jade I jade. Shout out! A few of the images in this video are courtesy of Mary Lou Ridinger from her presentation 3,000 Years of Trade Roots of Jade and Cacao and the Formation of the Maya Calendar for the Institute of Maya Studies. The Latin term for cacao is Theobroma cacao, food of the gods. Cacao is a difficult tree to grow. Cacao requires humid, tropical environments within a narrow band 20 degrees north and south of the equator. Nowadays, it's grown in these ecosystems around the globe. In Mesoamerica, there are many cacao-growing regions. And within these latitude zones, cacao could be grown on both coasts of Mesoamerica. The earliest evidence of cacao in Mesoamerica is around 2000 BCE. Most Mesoamerican cultures consider cacao beans as money. And one of the places of early evidence of cacao consumption was the Soconosco area. Here are two representations of Akawak or Ekchua, the Maya god of cacao. Here, Ekchua appears as a Maya merchant with a cacao tree in the famous mural at Cacaxla in the highlands of Mexico. Maya lords were frequently depicted on polychrome vases with chocolate being offered to them. From Justin Kerr's Maya Vase database, in this example, a Maya lord is depicted who looks like he's rejecting the frothy cacao that's being offered to him. There are many representations in Maya art of gods, kings, and traders, and many depictions of cacao merchants. Very frequently, God El, the merchant god, is depicted. Recurrent attributes of God El are a bundle of merchandise and a walking stick. The floating ends of God El's cloth can show footsteps, 
again pointing to traveling merchants. The wealth of God El has been suggested to refer specifically to the cacao orchards of the Gulf Coast. God El is sometimes shown smoking a cigar, as in this panel within the Temple of the Cross at Palenque. The cigar smoked by God El suggests the protective magic of a merchant or perhaps the habit of a shaman. The owl in the feathery hat points to a connection to the underworld and night. The jaguar attributes are also a reference to night and the underworld. It has been suggested that God El is the underworld counterpart of, of its Emna, the supreme Maya deity and mascot of the Institute of Maya Studies. The Nahuatl word for cacao is chocolaro. There are many depictions of cacao in their surviving codices. From the early days of Teotihuacan and throughout the Aztec time period, they controlled extensive trade networks from the highlands of central Mexico all the way down the Pacific coast to Costa Rica and Panama. The Aztecs demanded tribute of cacao and jade, and on this page we see products native to the Soconusco region, jade, tropical bird feathers, jaguar skins, and cacao. According to Bernard Diaz del Castillo, when the Spanish first arrived at the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, they witnessed King Moctezuma being served more than 50 jars of foaming chocolato. The Aztecs said that cacao beverage was for success with women. The first syllables of cacao, spelled with two Ks, are homophonous with the first consonant and vowel in the Proto-Mayan words for two, ka, and fish, car. A visual representation of this wordplay occurs in glyphic spellings of cacao in which a fish or a fish fin is read as the syllable ka. The association between cacao and fish can subsequently be traced through mythology and iconographic representations providing insight in the metaphorical value of cacao as a potent symbol of rebirth. Cacao as fish in the mythology and symbolism of the ancient Maya is an academic paper by archaeologist, researcher, and professor Michael Grove. On this map, we can see early dates for cacao in Mesoamerica. The supposed place of origin for Theobroma cacao was in the Amazon basis before 3000 before the Common Era, now pushed back to around 4000 BCE. The cacao reached the Alua Valley in northern Honduras by 1900 BCE. The jade and cacao evidence from the Olmec region around Tres Apotes would have been from 1500 to 1300 BCE. The earliest dates for cacao use are probably from the Alua Valley region on the north coast of Honduras, and it probably could also have been found in pockets of small micro-regions in Belize, Veracruz, and Tabasco. A recent article has proven that cacao is grown in certain areas around cenotes in the Yucatan. The Crow Canyon Archaeological Center has posted the video of archaeologist Pat Patricia Crown's recent presentation, Search, The House of the Cylinder Jars, Room 28 in Pueblo Bonito, Chaco Canyon, documenting where many ceramic vessels containing cacao residue were excavated in the U.S. Southwest. The first chemical evidence of cacao use was shown right before the end of the previous millennium after the analysis of residue from a vessel found at the Maya site of Rio Azul in northeastern Guatemala. The vessel containing cacao residue belonged to the early classic period Maya culture, approximately 460 CE. A glyph for cacao is prominently displayed on the side of the vessel. Here are many vestiges of ceramic vessels from the Maya area of influence depicting cacao. 
a ceramic bowl depicting the maize god as a personified cacao tree, an incense sensor lid of a woman with cacao from the southern coast of Guatemala, a lidded vessel in the form of a comorant from the Paten jungles of Guatemala, and very early examples from along the main Pacific coast trade route, including a spouted vessel for adding froth to cacao from the ancient site of Chiapa de Corso, ceramic vessels used for cacao from San Lorenzo, a fragment of a ceramic vessel used for, for cacao from Paso de Amado, and is painted tripod vessel and lidded tripod vessel with hieroglyphics from the Paten of Guatemala. I mentioned that the jaguar was one of the ways or spirit companion of the merchant god and god El. Here's why. The jaguar was considered to be a protector of cacao plantations in the Olmec and Maya worlds. Jaguars were supernatural figures associated with the underworld. People feared jaguars, and a jaguar protecting a cacao plantation would frighten thieves. Jaguars were also associated with caves, which were sacred portals to the underworld. Now let's explore some scientific research on cacao. The European Society of Cardiology published the results of a three-year study on the effects of chocolate consumption on health. The study was published in 2011, and here is some evidence in favor of chocolate's protective effects. The study suggests that chocolate consumption has a positive influence on human health as a antioxidant, antihypertensive, anti-inflammatory, anti-atherogenic and anti-thrombotic effects. The latest study, the results of which were published simultaneous online in the British Medical Journal, showed that high chocolate consumption was associated with a 37% decrease in cardiovascular disease and a 29% decrease in the risk of stroke. Studies show that a compound found in chocolate called phenolethylamine is the same chemical that the brain releases when a person experiences attraction. Additionally, chocolate consumption beneficially influences insulin sensitivity, vascular endothelial function, and activation of nitric oxide. Here is a regional map showing areas involved in the production of cacao over the greater Mesoamerican area. The dark brown areas have the highest yields. And shade grown cacao trees can produce fruit for 75 to 100 years. The distribution of cacao was along well established inter regional trade routes. Here's a map showing the modern trade and production of cacao around the planet. If you look closely at the text, I can't believe how much cacao is imported by the Netherlands. The Netherlands is an important cacao trade hub within Europe. It is the world's largest cacao bean importer and the world's second largest cacao processor. The Netherlands is an important re-exporter of cacao beans and semi-finished cacao products to other European destinations. In 2020, Dutch imports amounted to 895,000 tons. This is 24% of the global cacao bean imports. The Netherlands sourced 99% of their cacao beans directly from producing countries, and the demand for high-quality cacao is growing and attracting further interest in cacao beans from Latin American countries. The next time you're in the Maya lands, check out the Echo Museum of Cacao. It is located in the town of Tikul, kilometer 20 on the Puk route between Labna and Shlachpak in the Yucatan. It's definitely a sweet place to visit 
Plus, you can score some free samples. Jade is found in several places around the world. There are two types of jade. Nephrite and jadeite are the correct mineralogical terms. And jade forms on tectonic plate boundaries, mostly in Asia and Canada. And we're very lucky to have a source of jadeite jade in Guatemala, true jade in the Americas. Jade is the result of two tectonic plates colliding furiously against each other. To create the perfect jade making conditions, these slow moving sliding slabs of earth need to rack up a whopping 600 degrees of centigrade and a literal earth crushing 500,000 pounds of pressure for every square inch. Guatemala sits on top of two of these tectonic plates, commonly known as the Motagua Fault Line, which runs east to west through Guatemala's southeast highlands. The jade forms on the tectonic plate boundaries in Guatemala between the North American plate and the Caribbean plate. The jade sources in Guatemala were first probably mined by the ancient Maya as early as 1500 BCE and the jade sources were no longer being mined at the time of the Spanish conquest. In 1974, archaeologist Mary Lou Reidinger and husband anthropologist J. Reidinger discovered jade specimens in the Motagua River, a 250 mile long river in the western highlands of Guatemala that runs along the Motagua Fault. Upon further investigation, the anthropologist discovered three pre-Columbrian quarry sites with enough jade to re-establish the Guatemalan trade industry of jade that had sat dormant for 450 years. Soon after, the Ridingers established a company called Hades S.A.A. to work the jade, and despite COVID, continued a retail store in Antigua, Guatemala, now called Jade Maya or Jade Maya. Here are some prime examples of Maya jade artifacts. The jade would have been extracted from the sites in the Sierra de las Minas and the Motagua Valley and cut into axe heads as a medium of exchange. The Maya not only considered jade as a symbol of status and wealth, but also as a passport to the next life. As such, it adorned the tombs of the royal and the prestigious kings, for example, were buried in jade masks and chest plates which acted like a first-class ticket through the underworld, inner celestial travel as its finest. The traditional everyday Maya person, on the other hand, was buried beneath the floors of their own homes with their mouths stuffed full of food, along and only sometimes with a single jade bead. Note dental inlays of jadeite, and this 14-pound jade head of Kenesha Howe, the Solar Lord, was discovered by David Pendergrass at the Maya site of Altunha. Here are two prime examples of jade showing up on polychrome Maya vases in the Kerr Maya vase database. An offering of jade to Itzam Na and the Hero Twins from the Popal Vu, dressed in their jade finery. Here are examples of jade showing up in an excavated tombs of Maya kings, from Pakal the Great of Palenque, tomb 90 from Tikal, a jade monkey from the tomb of Yashkuk Mo, the founder of the Copan dynasty, and tomb 196 of Tikal with a vase with cacao residue from tomb 196. Tomb 196, the tomb of the jade jaguar of Tikal, was discovered by Nicholas Helmuth in 1963 when he was just 19 years old. Seems that he had beginner's luck to discover one of the most richly stocked royal burials of the entire ancient Maya realm. It is rare that an archaeologist has the opportunity to find the burial chamber of one of the great kings of the ancient civilization. 
Dr. Helmuth will be our live streaming presenter on Monday, September 19th, and will discuss this discovery. In 2004, archaeologist David Lee discovered an immense amount of jade within the tomb of the late classic so-called warrior queen at El Peru Huaca, located in the Paten jungles of Guatemala. The Maya associated jade with the sun and the wind. The Olmec preferred blue-green jade because it represented water, therefore representing the underworld in Olmec iconography. But where was the blue-green jade to be found? In 1998, Hurricane Mitch, a devastating storm, hit Central America. Thousands died as floods and landslides reshaped the landscape. Old veins of jade were exposed as deposits and washed up on riversides. The elusive Olmec blue jadeite was rediscovered in the southern part of the Montagua Valley by geophysicist Russell Seitz of Cambridge and with a team of jade researchers. The Motagua River paralyzed a left lateral Motagua fault that offsets the rocks of the region by 1,200 kilometers. This displacement led geologists to believe that south of the fault lay different basement and surface rocks and hence there was no reason to look there. But Seitz was suspicious and in 1999, while touring this area, he saw an unmistakable Olmec jade handicraft in a jade shop in Antigua and after subsequent questioning, the Olmec blue jade was rediscovered south of the river. In an interesting story, the Proto-Maya mined their jade on the north side of the Motagua River. They moved it by river and across established land routes well inland and upriver in Belize. Other tribes on the south side of the river controlled the sources of blue-green jade. They apparently were able to totally and probably very elusively transport their jade all the way around the Yucatan Peninsula to the Olmec heartland. The Olmecs subsequently traded their blue-green jade down the Pacific trade route to sites in the Soconusco region, Chiapas, Guatemala, and all the way down to Costa Rica. Jade Maya now has more different colors of jade than any other jade source in the world. Next to emery, jade was the hardest mineral known to ancient Mesoamerica. In the absence of metal tools, ancient craftsmen used tools themselves made of jade, leather straps, string saws to cut and carve jade, and reeds or other hard materials to drill holes. Working the raw stone into a finished piece was a very labor-intensive process, often requiring repeated physical movement to shape the jade. It would take many hours of work to create even a single jade bead. Craftsmen employed lapidary techniques such as pecking, percussion, grinding, sawing, drilling, and incising to shape and decorate jade. Several of these techniques were thought to imbue pieces with religious or symbolic meaning. For instance, drilling holes into jade was thought to give the piece life or to animate a carving. Here's an interesting sculpture. It's a statue of Oscar Wilde in Marion Square in Dublin. The piece was created by sculptor Danny Osborne and used Guatemalan jadeite jade to carve his head and hands. You don't see something like this every day. Here's a map that I created based on Google satellite imagery to show the Mesoamerican region during the hunter-gatherer archaic period that spanned from around 14,000 to 9,000 BCE. There were definitely people moving about the region, as the remains of a woman who was apparently trampled by a mastodon have been excavated in the Mexican highlands dating to around 11,000 BCE. And two skeletons have been retrieved from an underwater cave off the coast of Tulum that date to 14,000 and 13,000 BCE. The bodies were laid to rest inside the then dry cave but back in the times before the waters rose at the end of the last ice age. Global sea level rose by a total of more than 120 meters 
as the vast ice sheets melted back. This melt back lasted from about 19,000 to around 6,000 years ago, meaning that the average rate of sea level rise was roughly one meter per century. This map shows the earliest trade routes and contact from around 10,000 to 3,000 BCE. There were settled villages all along the Pacific coast starting from around 4,200 to 3,300 BCE. The passageway between the mountains from the Pacific coast to the Gulf Coast, called the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, was very important in the constant movement of trade goods and the exchange of ideas and concepts. This map shows the elaboration of trade routes in the Maya area during the pre-classic period. There's a focus on cacao, jade, flint, and cotton. Evidence for early trade between the sources of jade in the Motagua Valley of Guatemala and the trade of cacao along the same routes allows the observer to draw a map of far-flung regions which were in contact through trade as early as 1700 BCE. Note the water route of trade from northern South America along the Caribbean and Gulf coasts definitely by canoe travel. Here's a map showing another view of these same trade routes. Note that you can see the western tip of Cuba. Most remarkable is the recent tracing by mineralogist George Harlow of pre-classic jadeite axes found on the island of Antigua, back to their parent mines in Guatemala. Antigua is nearly 3,000 kilometers east of the Motagua Valley, as the crow flies, and 3,500 kilometers island hopping Cuba, Hispaniola, and so on. Rocks don't float. Only by canoe could they have made their way across the entire Caribbean. A, a unique and valuable trade item tends to become more valuable as it is traded farther from its source. The incentive is to profit by continuing to trade it until one of three things happen. An owner can't bear to part with it, it reaches a cultural area where it is not valued, or it reaches the bitter end of the trade route. For the jadeite axes found on Antigua, the second and third may have both applied. Antigua was the far eastern edge of the Tayano cultural area and of the Caribbean island chain. Spondylus shells were one of the earliest trade items. Its symbolic value was also extraordinary. Seashells and their relationship with water gave them a symbolism associated to the underwater world, with water being one of the entrances to the underworld. Also, seashells were related to royal lineages because they were used as precious jewelry by the Maya nobility and members of the royal court. In fact, she shells were highly appreciated by nobles as ornaments on their attire, used in the ways of necklaces, bracelets, belts, ear flares, and nose ornaments, or attached to their headdresses or to their costumes, just as we have seen have appeared in mural paintings and ceramic pictorial art. Spondylus shells have a characteristic bright orange or red color, as well as a spiny surface. This shell has its origin off the coast of Ecuador, and to reach them, the local co collectors had to dive as deep as 25 meters underwater. Afterwards, they traveled through long-distance trade networks along the Pacific coastline for more than 3,800 kilometers until they reached the coast of the Maya area and the Soconusco region of southern Mexico. The spondyla shell was a very precious object due to its difficulty in obtaining it. Throughout its commercial route, it was also accessible to different cultures in which it could be exchanged for other products of similar or higher value. This spiny shell was also used to collect the blood offered during self-sacrifice bloodletting ceremonies. Important events among the ruling families, such as births, inaugurations, or accessions to the throne, were accompanied by dances, music, and bloodletting practices. Spondyla shells were buried in caches or hidden offerings, usually with sacred objects in their interior, such as jade beads, shark teeth, 
or stingray spines. Concerning intercontinental travel by water, Thor Heyerdahl, the late Norwegian adventurist, decided to try to prove that human migration between continents was possible. Recounted in his book Kantiki, the reed boat Ra 2 was made by this man who's climbing the ladder, Dimitrio Lamachi from Bolivia. Thor proved his point, and the Mochi stirrup vessel features a canoe paddler from the north coast of Peru. Seaborne contacts between South America and Mexico may well have started around 3000 BCE, but was commonplace by at least 2000 BCE for numerous artifacts and cultural traits tracing to Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru have been discovered along the Pacific coast of Mexico as far north as the states of Colima, Jalisco, and Nayarit. Without a doubt, Soponusco played an active part in these exchanges as well, for it was endowed with a variety of commodities that gave it a special prominence in trade, including cacao, quetzal feathers, and rubber. Here we see that following the turtles who migrated back and forth from the northern Pacific coast of South America to the beaches of the Soconusco coast, the first trade was in corn and manioc in the early archaic period. Corn appears traded well inland to El Mirador around 2750 BCE. The first wave of pottery, the Barra ceramic complex, appears around 1700 to 1500 BCE. There was also archaic contact along the Caribbean coast from Bolivia. Remember that cacao first appeared in the Ulua Valley of Honduras in 1900 BCE. The Oco ceramic complex makes its debut first along the Pacific coast between 1500 and 1200 BCE, making it all the way to San Lorenzo in the Olmec heartland around 1250 BCE. Here we see the expansion of civilization in Mesoamerica between around 1600 to 1400 BCE. Note that Izapa is situated right in the center of all the action. The Olmec had originally started when Zoki tribes made it across the Sierra Madres via the Tehuantepec Pass and found themselves in the largest alluvial lowland in all of Mexico, an expanse of tropical rainforests far vaster than that from which they had come in Soconusco. They constructed the first of their major ceremonial centers at San Lorenzo around 1200 BCE. As the Zoke debouched further out into the coastal plain, they founded their next oldest settlements at La Venta to the east and at Laguna de los Cerros to the west, both around 1000 BCE. Tres Zapotes was founded about 800 BCE. From these large ceremonial centers, the now deemed Olmec traveled back across the isthmus and way down the Pacific coastal trade routes to influence every major settlement along the way. In this spinal map in this series, it all comes together when it comes to the pre-classic trade routes and the products traded across the Maya lands and beyond. We see not only jade and cacao, but also salt, ceramics, cotton, honey, obsidian, animal skins, feathers, flint, meaning tools, and spondylus. The close relationship along these routes also allowed astronomical information and calendrics as well as religious symbols and myths to be shared throughout the region. Geez, imagine how many hours it took me to create this map, and I'm showing it to you for only a minute. Enjoy! This carved stone, in the shape of a turtle's head at the Zappa, is magnetically polarized with the exact center of the nose attracting a compass needle, the midsection repelling the needle, and the end section away from the nose attracting the south end of a compass needle. Although we have no idea how such properties were recognized in the first place, there is little doubt that they were. It has been loosely suggested that this figure might have some association with the homing instincts of turtles, a major hint from Izapa. 
Vincent Maelstrom speculates the magnetism may have been the magical power by which sea turtles found their way across great expanses of ocean. He also suggests that the magnetic turtle may hint at Zoke Olmec contacts with the Chinese, since they also made their early compasses in the shape of turtles. Thank you, Vincent. Here's another sculpture from Izapa that provides another hint, and they're not being very subtle about it. Depicted here is a bufous toad, and you may be aware or not to keep your pets away from chasing these species of toads because the glands on their shoulders are hallucinogenic. It's not too much of a stretch of the imagination to theorize that the ancient Izapan sky watchers who stayed up all night contemplating the heavens and figuring out the calendars may have derived some inspiration from these toads. And the canoe traveler floating on the tongue of the toad is yet another hint to be taken seriously. So let me show you why Izapa is where it's at. Zappa was aligned to the Tajamoko Volcano, the tallest mountain peak in all of Mesoamerica, which would have been perceived as the first land to emerge from the primordial waters of creation, as related in the Popovu creation story. The first structure at Zappa was a small ceremonial platform, oriented to the and facing the volcanic peaks. They came to the Zappa 14.8 degree latitude because the sacred 260-day almanac day count could be measured from the sun's zenith on August 13th to the winter solstice and back to zenith again on April 30th, 260 days. This was first observed by Vincent Maelstrom in 1973. To begin with, let's start with the satellite image of the Pacific Coast area where the border between Chiapas, Mexico and Guatemala is. The large town visible is Tapachula. Let's superimpose the 14.8 degree latitude. Let's add the Takana volcano which rises 4,093 meters in height. Now let's add the Tajamulco volcano, the highest mountain in all of Mesoamerica rising to 4,220 meters. At the 14.8 degree latitude, the zenithal sun passes directly overhead on August 13th and April 30th, 260 days apart. This is the area where the 260 day sacred Zoltzkin calendar was initiated. The southward passage of the zenithal sun over Soconusco is heralded by the Perseid meteor shower on the two preceding evenings. The Maya site of Copan lies due east along the 14.8 degree latitude, and Copan is where the Quiche Maya went to receive their right to rule, as described in the beginning of the Popovu creation story. Next, let's add the helical rising of Venus directly over the peak of the Tajamulco volcano on August 13th. 1359 BCE. The Zoki priest who formulated the sacred calendar must surely have taken notice of the rising of Venus directly over the volcano. What a day that must have been for the astronomers at Izapa to have the zenithal sun directly overhead, then the rise of Venus over the volcano right after sunset. The calendrical regularity of Venus's helical rising slowly became readily apparent to our Zoki astronomer priest, as is also the fact that with every fifth completion of its cycle, Venus once more rises in the vicinity of the Tajamulco volcano. As we have seen, assigning a length of 584 days to the cycle of Venus allowed for a very convenient way to calibrate it calendrically. Although every fifth time its helical rise once again took place over Tajamulco, the interval between it and the zenithal passage of the sun steadily continued to widen. Had the priest chosen an interval of 584.4 days for the duration of the Venus cycle, the two events would have remained in phase with one another. But the fact that he did not 
strongly suggests that he was unable to conceive of any temporal unit shorter than an entire day. In other words, mathematically, he was able to think in integers, but not in fractions. Now, another very important alignment, as viewed from Azapa to the Tajamuku volcano, is the summer solstice sunrise on June 22nd. Amazing. If we add back in the helical rising of Venus, we can see how it all comes together. And if we connect the light blue alignment lines to where they intersect, we can see why Azapa was located where it's at. The Maya's long count is the recording in hieroglyphic text utilizing both the sacred Zoskin and the Hob calendars to portray dates. The earliest recorded dates in the Long Count calendar, carved in stone, in the formative pre-classic period, date from Chiapa de Corzo in 36 BCE, to the early dates of Tres Zapotes in Tabasco at 32 BCE, to the early dates of El Baul at 37 CE, and Takalikabac at 83 and 103 CE. There's also early dates at La Morjada, which chimes in at 143 and 156 CE, and in the Tuxla Mountains in 162 CE. There's also a possible date from a fragmented Long Count monument from Takalikabak, the sister city of Izapa, which may date to 39 BCE, making it the oldest known dated Long Count Monument. So, if we take away the dates and leave the dots, we see that all of the settlements lie along the main Maya Pacific coast to the Olmec Heartland trade route that was in place for millennia. The common denominator for the spread of formative religious concepts, astronomical observations, the Long Count calendar, and the Popovu creation story may have been the intensive trade of cacao and jade. The trade routes existed for a thousand years before the creation of the sacred 260-day calendar and the Long Count calendar system, which may explain its rapid diffusion. Here is a short series of maps to show the diffusion of the 260-day sacred calendar from its initiation around Izapa in 1325 BCE. By 1000 BCE, the calendar was shared all down the Pacific Coast trade routes and up into the Olmec heartland. By 600 BCE, it was in use further up into the highlands and both coasts of Mexico, as well as further inland in the Maya region. By 300 BCE, it was even more in use across all of Mesoamerica. So the Maya got their cacao, jade, and calendars. And the world got their chocolate and jade from the Americas. The best takeaway about chocolate is that one researcher suggests that a nutrient in cacao called epicatechin appears to lower the risk of four common killer diseases strokes, heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. Enjoy! Cacao brings a smile to everyone's face. Times two. So you can have your cake and eat it too. Thanks for tuning in.